morning, everyone. Please turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, that's on page 1118 of the church Bible. Three ones and an eight. Paul and his team have been traveling around telling people about the Lord Jesus. In some places, planting churches, facing a a whole different bunch of reactions. Uh, And we're going to pick up the story. They're in a city called Ephesus. Acts chapter 19, verse 8. And he, that's Paul, entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Let me pray briefly. Our Father in heaven, without the help of your Holy Spirit, We will not be able to understand any of your words. We ask for his great help now. Change us. Make us more like the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Keep your Bible open there. And picture this scene just for a moment with me. It's 2027. It's Friday afternoon outside McDonald's up in Barnett High Street. There's lots of kids there, it's just after school. They're taking selfies and making whatever TikToks are in 2027. Some people are looking very confused. That's, that's a thing, okay? But, uh, it's a thing. But as you listen to their conversation, they're talking about this thing called the Word of the Lord. Later that evening, in the railway tavern down in New Barnet, and at the railway bell, and in the tennis club just not far from here, men and women are taking their drinks back to the seats, and someone at the table pipes up, what's this word of the Lord I keep hearing about? The next morning, something close to my heart, people are queuing up for sausage rolls and greggs. And you hear two old ladies talking... And they're talking about the word of the Lord. You go for a haircut. Some people have to do that. Um, But you go for a haircut and and the person that cuts your hair pipes up and says, have you been hearing about this word of the Lord? That afternoon, you go to Underhill to the newly crowned Premier League champions, Barna FC, and in the crowd before the game, there's a murmur. People are talking about the word of the Lord. That evening, you fancy a meal out, you go over to Cock Foster's. At each table, up and down that row, you know, the, the Cock Foster strip, people are talking about the word of the Lord. What's happened? Wouldn't that be jaw dropping, amazing, mind blowing? If that were the case, Okay, our church, I'm used to a little bit of interaction, okay? Okay, don't be scared. Go with me. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Now, immediately I know that some of you will say, impossible. Impossible. Well, before you go to there, something like that has happened before. In the Roman province of Asia, that includes a city called Ephesus. And it was impossible there then just as it seems impossible here now. Look at verse 10. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Now it's not saying that everyone became a Christian 
although I suspect a lot of people did. But it is saying that everyone heard the message of the Lord Jesus. The province of Asia was about a third of the size of the country that we would know as Turkey. And the idea of saying that all the Jews and Greeks who lived there is kind of like saying all kinds of different people from all sorts of background heard the word of the Lord. I don't know how many people that includes, but clever people who have wrote, written books about it think that about a quarter of a million people lived in Ephesus alone. We're talking about a lot of people. And because of a passage like this, I don't think it's a pipe dream for churches like this, for churches like ours, to be praying towards and working towards. Wouldn't it be great if we could say in a few years' time, everyone in the province of Barnet has heard the word of the Lord? No? Yes. 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 As we head towards passion for life, wouldn't that be a great thing to be praying? To pray big prayers like that? I'm not trying to scare you this morning. I want us to see that God can do extraordinary things. Now, I suppose if we want to aim at everyone in hearing the word of the Lord, we've got to have an idea of what that actually is, what it includes. That little phrase comes up a few times through these middle chapters of the book of Acts. When people are said to have heard the word of the Lord, they're almost certain to have heard that we are sinners who need to be rescued from our sins. That someone has come into the world to do that, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he saves us by dying on the cross and rising again. And that each one of us personally need to trust the Lord Jesus. That he died in our place to forgive us and rose again. And it's interesting, at least I found it interesting, that when people are said to have heard the word of the Lord in these chapters, they've heard not just how to become a follower of Jesus, but actually what it looks like to follow the Lord Jesus through all the stages of life. If we want people in the province of Barnet to to say that they've heard the word of the Lord, we're going to have to share with them that the Lord Jesus has come to rescue them and he died and and rose again. Uh, How they can become Christians, but also how they follow him and continue to follow him through their whole lives. This is his message. What we declare What I hope we'll declare over these coming weeks and months and years comes from him. It's what he came to live and die and be raised from death for. He promises he's going to help us as we declare his word. He's given us his Holy Spirit into each one of our lives if we've asked for him to forgive our sins. He's given us his word to help us that as we speak, people will hear the word of the Lord. Now, I think there are some things that we can learn from Paul and his team this morning as they went to Ephesus. If I were to say to you this morning, just think about this, the R number is high. Okay, what was the R number about? Okay, it was to do with coronavirus, remember that? People used to talk about the R number. Well, the R number was pretty much the average amount of people that if you had coronavirus, you would spread it on to. So if the R number was one, how many people do you think on average you would pass it on to? Excellent. You're getting the idea. Brilliant. If the R number is three, how many people on average are you going to pass it on to? If the R number is 15, run for the hills. Okay? When it comes to people hearing the word of the Lord in the province of Asia... The gospel R number from Paul and his team is really, really high. There's just a few of them that go to that city. And yet we're told within a few years, everyone in that province had heard the word of the Lord. How is that gospel R number so big? How might we get our gospel R number just up a little bit? Well, here's the first thing. They speak 
boldly. They speak boldly. Look at verse 8. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. Down the years, I've often been involved in a little bit of street outreach, okay? The kind of thing where you go up to someone, you give them a gospel, or, you know, we'd like to pray for you. That kind of, here's my approach or what it's been like very often. Um, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, would you... I, 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 I don't want to import... Would you like a gospel? As, as if I'm, there's something to apologize for. One time I was out with a 90-year-old man, a brother who's now with the Lord Jesus Christ, and he walked up to this group of young guys who looked pretty tough and menacing, and he, and he, he started with this. I'd like to tell you about things of eternal significance. And I thought, oh, here we go. You know, he was with them for 40 minutes, sharing his testimony, telling them about Jesus, sharing the word of the Lord. And I think that approach is probably a little bit closer to Paul's approach than to mine. There was a great belief that God's word is powerful and effective. That Jesus is worth speaking about. That we've got nothing to be ashamed of. Now, if you're new to church, Paul was from a Jewish background. Often when he went to new towns and cities, if there was a synagogue, he would go there and he would reason with the Jewish people in the synagogue using the Old Testament scriptures. And that's what he does. He does it for three months. Did you notice he spoke boldly, but also reasonably, he was reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. Reasoning and persuading doesn't sound like he was shouting at people down the street. It sounds to me like he was taking his time, answering questions, thinking about the answers that he was going to give. A bit like the Lord Jesus, who often would speak boldly in synagogues and take his time with people and answer questions, speaking about God's kingdom until people said, we've never heard anything like this. I suspect not many of us will speak in the local synagogue. But when was the last time you or I spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading with anyone about the Lord Jesus Christ? When was the last time we spoke boldly in our schools, at our workplaces, maybe with our families? I know that is really hard. One of the hardest places to speak about the Lord Jesus. When was the last time you or I spoke boldly about him? Because if people in the province of Barnet are going to hear the word of the Lord, you and I, us, we're going to need to speak boldly about him. If you're not sure where to start, you can speak about what the Lord Jesus has done in your own life. You are walking, talking evidence if you are one of his followers of, of how much he's done in this world. He's rescued you. You can, you can share that with people. That is powerful. Now, I also know that there'll be some people in this room who love the, the arguing and the speaking bit uh, and, you know, love that. Remember the gentle bit? The persuasive bit? Okay? It's too easy to get involved in shouting matches especially in social media. I know there'll be some people who love that. Whoa. Reasoning and persuading. There's a lady that's part of our church family who became a widow over the pandemic. She's recently started to meet up with two or three other widows in the area. How she's found them, I don't know, but she has. And she's told them how the Lord Jesus has helped her through the pandemic, through her loss. Two of those ladies have started coming along to church. We'll be there this morning at Berry Street. One of them has become a believer. Why? Because she will speak boldly about Jesus. To look at this lady, you would not think she's a bold speaker. 
but she believes that God's word is powerful and effective and wants her gospel our number to rise. What else happened? Well, as the, the our number, the gospel our number started to rise, opposition started to come, didn't it? Um, let me read verse 9. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, Paul withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. It doesn't say Paul spoke in the synagogue and, hey, hallelujah, everyone became a Christian. Some people's hearts get harder to the message. No matter what Paul and the other disciples say, there's a group of people who refuse to believe, who campaign against them. We don't know what they said, but, but perhaps they said, well, Christians want to overthrow the government, or we, Christians in other cities have started riots. Christians are bad for business. Maybe in our day, Christians are bigots and racists and homophobes. Don't listen to them Christians. They're wrong. What they say is bad. It's not worth considering. Keep your children away from them. It's bad for society. I highlight this. Because if we are serious about speaking boldly, about wanting everyone in the province of Barnet to hear the word of the Lord, opposition will come. We're engaged in a spiritual battle. The devil does not want everyone in the province of Barnet to hear the word of the Lord. He would rather we were quiet, that we would shut up, that we would go away. Again, think of the Lord Jesus. When he spoke... What did the people in his day say? His enemy said he's in league with the devil. He's possessed. He's a madman. He's friends with tax collectors and sinners. We've got no king but Caesar, and this guy wants to overthrow the government. Crucify him. I want to say don't be put off. If you face opposition as you speak boldly about the Lord Jesus... Because opposition always comes against gospel work. It does not mean that we're doing something wrong. It's likely to happen when we are being faithful and speaking the word of the Lord in the province of Barnet. So what do they do? Well, here's the next thing. They mix it up. Okay? Verse 9, we read that. Um, he, Paul leaves the synagogue. He takes the disciples with him. And he goes to the lecture hall of Tyrannus. He went down the public, he went down the road and went to a local public hall. Now we don't know who Paul was speaking to, whether it was young people or old people or rich people or poor people or to how many he was doing it. Some things do help us though. He went to where people were and kept speaking about Jesus. Paul wasn't just a synagogue guy. He wasn't just a market guy. He wasn't just a Hall of Tyrannus guy. He wanted as many people as possible to hear the good news of the Lord Jesus so that people would hear the word of the Lord. Now, I don't know if that means that everyone in the province of Asia had to come to the Hall of Tyrannus. It it would have been huge if that was the case. But maybe some people came. And then as they went back to the towns and villages or they went throughout the city to where they lived, What happened was that they heard the word of the Lord. We're going to have to have a lot of different approaches if we want everyone in the province of Barnet to hear that. It's why something like Passion for Life is really, really helpful. Lots of different things going on. Lots of things you can invite your friends to or your neighbors or your brother or your sister because there's going to be a need to reach older people and younger people and park runners and book readers and book reading park runners and and musicians and, and carers and parents and teachers and plumbers and people who are unemployed and people who work for the council and people who live next door to us. Are we getting the idea? Great. Why? Because we want everyone in the province of Barnet to hear the word of the Lord, many of whom will never walk through those doors. The Lord Jesus doesn't say to us, 
This is the only way that we should do this. Or there's one way. He calls us to go. Matthew 9, he, he says, ask the Lord of the harvest, don't they, to, to send workers into his harvest field. Uh, and the people he says that to, his disciples, uh, in Matthew 10, he's the ones he says, go. Go. You guys go. When I was at school, you know the question I dreaded most on a Monday morning? What did you do yesterday? I was a genius at squirming my way out of that question. I'd give you 50 different excuses rather than say I was at church. I, I, I look at my... And, and I would have said I was a Christian at that point. And I think... I missed the opportunity with my friends. Maybe I was the only Christian that they would ever meet in their whole life. Me. The Lord Jesus had put me there, I think, to declare the word of the Lord in that school with them guys. I often say to our church family, it's no accident. The family the Lord Jesus has put you in, the street the Lord Jesus has put you in, the school or workplace you're in, all those seemingly normal, average, everyday things, the Lord Jesus has maybe placed you right there that others would hear the word of the Lord through you. A couple more things, okay? Next one is this. It takes time. It's going to take a bit of time. Okay, have a look at verse 8 again. How, how long was Paul in the synagogue for in Ephesus? Sorry? Three months. three months. Yeah, three months. How long was he at the hall of Tyrannus for? Three years. Yeah. There's something about the slow, steady, drip, drip, drip. This is not the Bon Jovi one night world tour, okay? It's not one night in Glasgow, one night in London, one night in Berlin, one night in, I don't know, Johannesburg. This is Paul saying, no, we're going to stay here. And we're going to see what, the, what God's going to do. It's going to take time. As the Lord Jesus spent three years about with his disciples, their lives were transformed. They watched him pray. They watched him react to opposition. They spent time with him. They asked him questions. If the province of Barnet is going to be reached, it's going to take time. It's a marathon, not a sprint. There's something about the steady being around. Keep on speaking. Don't be put off. One more thing, and it's this. Paul and his team expected God to work in extraordinary ways. Okay, now listen carefully about this, because um, we've got to be clear in our minds what's going on. Verse 11, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. My instant reaction to these verses is to read them and be cautious. I'm not Paul, okay? I brought my handkerchief this morning. It is the opposite effect. If you come close, you'll get sick. You'll not be made well, okay? <laughs> the fact that the words there are used, extraordinary miracles, I think it's telling us that something rare was happening. I ask myself, is this just a description of what was happening in Ephesus? Or is it likely to happen today? Maybe I'm too cautious. But when the gospel breaks new ground in a place in the book of Acts, often accompanied with this, the message of the Lord Jesus are these miracles that seem to rubber stamp the message. Does that make sense? And I don't think over these next few weeks that there's anything wrong in praying, Lord, will you do extraordinary things through your churches, 
as we try to reach people over passion for life. Now, when I use the word expect there, I, please don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying, God, you've got to do something as, as if we're ordering God to do it. But it's like, Lord, we know you're mighty and powerful. And we want to expect that you will transform people's lives. And we would love for everyone in the province of Barnet to hear your word. We have to close. Remember how I started? It's the year 27. Everyone in the province of Barnet is speaking about the word of the Lord. I don't know how long that's going to take. But often it starts as you and I Maybe bring to mind one person that we can pray for and think, how will I share the word of the Lord with that person today or tomorrow or this week? If you're a Christian, can I challenge you now to think about that person or that people that you'd love, maybe to invite a passion for life, but, but that, that you would care for so much that you would pray that they would hear the word of the Lord. Maybe share with your small group. I don't know if you do that here. I suspect you do. Who that person is. Get your group praying for them. This is going to take time. If you're not a Christian, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for sticking with me through this. But there's something I've got to challenge you with this morning. See, we're not told here in in the verses that I read what exactly Paul said. But in other places we do. And a couple of chapters earlier, he says to people who are not Christians, God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he's given proof of this by raising that same man from the dead. And he commands all people everywhere to turn from their sins and trust in him. And I would love if you would hear that word from the Lord today. To believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, thank you that people came to us and told us the word of the Lord. And that word came with power. And for many of us, as we heard of our need of the Lord Jesus, we responded in the right way by, in, in faith. And saying, yeah, we want to trust Jesus. We want to follow him all, with all of our lives. Father, we pray over the coming weeks and months and years that everyone in the province of Barnet would hear the word of the Lord and be changed. Give us a heart and passion for this. Give us all that we need for all that we face. In Jesus' name, amen.